Muchísimas gracias, un gusto compartir este video con todos ustedes. Nosotros ahora vamos a pasar al panel 4 de la conferencia, un panel dedicado a la educación a distancia en tiempos de pandemia, y el preámbulo a esa conversación, ese marco previo, nos lo va a dar Richard Weinsberg. Richard es experto en educación socioemocional y autor de la, del libro Los niños vulnerables, ¿Qué le duele a los niños de los Estados Unidos y qué podemos hacer por ellos? Elegido entre los 10 más importantes de todos los tiempos. Richard es profesor de educación en la Facultad de Educación y en la Escuela de Gobierno John F. Kennedy y director de la Facultad de Desarrollo Humano y Psicología de la Universidad de Harvard. Lo que vamos a ver ahora es una muy interesante conversación entre Marcela Rentería y Richard. Adelante, por favor. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. We're very pleased to be here in the last webinar. And the title of this uh, whole presentation is about distance education in times of pandemic. Again, my name is Marcela Renteria, and I am the executive director of the Harvard Chile Regional Office in, uh, for the region, uh, part of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard. We have done a program that is called Aprende Casa, where we had the support of five professors from Harvard helping us to overcome the challenges in this pandemic in terms of how to do hybrid education. And here's my big pleasure to introduce you to our great professor, Richard Weisburg. He is lecturer um, in education at Harvard Graduate School of Education and the School of Education as well. And he's also the master program in human development and psychology director. He focuses on childhood vulnerability and resilience and the achievements and the moral development, effective school services for children and many other topics that are very relevant to what we're trying to uh, understand and try to uh, make some progress for the future in the present. He leads the Making Caring Common Project, which is a national effort in the United States to set moral and social development priorities in child learning, in providing strategies for schools and parents to promote childcare, commitment to justice, and other key moral, emotional, and, so and social capacities. So with that introduction, we would like to have a brief conversation so that you can learn from his insight that is absolutely incredible uh, to see how we can adapt it to our own challenges in Chile and in Latin America. So welcome, Richard. And here is our first question. Ca can you hear me well? I can hear you well. It's a real pleasure to be here, Marcella. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So we will start with one question and we will see how it goes from there. We want to know what are the opportunities and threats from digital education and what offers in this new era? Let's start with that. Well, you know, my, my field is moral development. So my field is mm -hmm. how kids become good people, um, how kids develop the capacity to care about others, to care for people who are different from them relatively easy to care for people who are like you, but to care for people who are different from you in gender or race or class or other characteristics is very important. And in the digital world, you know, one of the things, you know, we're, I'm certainly concerned about is in social media is there are lots of harms that it can do to kids. And there's been quite a lot of attention to the harms it can do. There's a lot of bullying and sexual harassment that goes online. There's also this constant curating of yourself. And that means that other kids are seeing you with lots of friends and enjoy a celebration, which can make you feel like there's something wrong with you if you don't have a ton of friends and if you're not engaged in joyous celebration. And there's just cruelty and degradation that goes on online. So, you know, I'm very worried about our digital environment. But I would also say that there's some very positive things that can come out of our digital environment that many kids are forming friendships online that they would not have formed otherwise. Many kids are forming friendships with kids who are different from them that they would not have formed otherwise. They're finding communities of people that are different from them. Many kids are forming friendships with people like them, and that's very important, that if you are a kid, an LGBTQIA kid, if you are gay, for example, you might find other gay kids online that you really form important kinship with. Many young people are starting causes online. They're gathering together 
and working for justice in different ways online together, or they're working for voting rights, or they're doing a number of different things together online. So I think as adults, our responsibility is to try and reduce or eliminate some of the harmful impacts of the online space. But it's also to really understand and help kids utilize some of the positive aspects of being online as well. And, and what are the challenges that you think uh, developing these values and morals in this post-pandemic world that we're living or in this transition that we are? Well, I think, you know, there's there, there are a number of different challenges. You know, one of them is, you know, almost all of us value caring for other people. What's much harder is doing the hard work of caring. You know, it's being able to care for others when we have biases or stereotypes when we're angry, when we're jealous, when we're competitive, uh, when we're prideful, when we feel ashamed, all these things can get in the way of caring for other people. And so a lot of the work with children, I think, is helping them manage those emotions that get in the way of them caring for other people, helping them understand their biases and how those biases can contaminate their capacity to care for other people. Um, you know, in our particular time, one of the things that we see in our country, and I don't know if it's happening in your country, is there's a lot of polarization. People are very angry at each other across political parties. People are very angry at people who don't get vaccinated. You know, the people who don't get vaccinated. Um, a lot of people don't have empathy for those people, even when they're hospitalized um, and even when they're on the verge of dying if they didn't get vaccinated. And one of the things we have to do is teach our kids in these times to be able to hold conflicting feelings, that you can be angry at somebody and feel compassion for them. You can be angry and fearful about someone who is homeless, but you can also feel compassion for them. So being able to hold on to these conflicting feelings seems like an especially important thing to do in our time. What a, what a difficult uh, expression because it's hard for, for teachers to deal with these and even if it's online, how, how I mean, what, what is your perspective of what you can tell teachers, uh, for example, how they could deal with this with a kid while they are seeing the, these reactions and it's online, for example. When they're, when, they're, when they're seeing this, all the divisiveness online and all the anger online? Exactly. Yeah. No, I think you're asking a great question because I think that our development as adults, our development as parents, our development as teachers mm -hmm. is so crucial to kids' development, to kids' social, emotional, and moral development. So, you know, and it's not as if we enter adulthood and suddenly we're magically have all these moral qualities. We always, you know, it's a lifelong project for all of us to become more caring, to become um, more grateful, to become more uh to develop a deeper understanding of what justice is to become better at pursuing justice these are lifelong projects for all of us so i think your question is so important and you know i would say for teachers that we need colleagues and friends and opportunities for us to process what's going on in the world and for us to come to some kind of understanding of it um we need our friends to support us and help us be resilient in a very stressful time you know lots of teachers can feel disconnected and lonely and that's a very hard thing we need people who can help us understand how to take effect effective action during these times both you know effective action um to support people we care about to support ourselves but also effective action to address injustice in the world and problems in the world. And so we need communities that help us do those things. And if we have those communities, we are gonna be far better mentors to our children, far better models for our children, far better teachers for our children. Yes, and what's the difference that you can see between social, emotional learning and moral development? How how you understand these two uh, positions? Or... Well, I think social, emotional learning is, is incredibly important. I mean, you know, social learn, lo emotional learning is how you learn how to empathize, how you learn how to take other people's perspectives, how do you learn gratitude, how you learn how to self-regulate, to control your emotions. But it's different from moral development. I mean, moral de development, for one thing, is about motivation and identity. It's about what you care about and why you care about it. And one of the things that I am 
concerned about is that, you know, social emotional development is about something like perspective taking. Con men and torturers and politicians and salespeople can be very good at taking other perspectives, but they don't care about other people. And it's really important that we, uh, we cultivate in kids the capacity to care for other people, to be motivated to care for other people. Moral development is also about your understanding of systems. Is your community just? Is your society just? It's about um, whether communities are fair and just. So I don't think we can just talk about social emotional learning. I think we have to talk about moral development as well. And what are the challenges in this education uh, of global citizens um, as a whole a sphere of a bigger world that is not only your small community, but a bigger community? So I, you know, I think when we talk about global citizenry, we're talking about so many different types of countries. So, but, but, but let me just say a few things that strike me as very important. One is that we know The human condition, part of being human is having biases and stereotypes. It's how our brains are constructed. We, we all have biases and stereotypes of different kinds. So part of what people need to do in every country in education is help people understand their biases and help people understand their stereotypes. So those biases and stereotypes don't do harm to other people. And we don't support communities and systems that are unfair to people um, or degrading to people. So, you know, I think across the world, we need to do work on our biases and on our stereotypes. I think learning um, how to care for people who are different from you is something we can do across the world. I think thinking hard about what justice is and how do we create a school or a police force or a workplace that is really fair and just is work we can do across countries. So, I think there are a lot of things across countries that, that we need to be able to do, types of work we need to be able to do. I also think in, in a, our increasingly interconnected and global world, we really need to raise children to appreciate people from other cultures and other countries and to value people from other countries and other countries. And we need to bring in rich, vibrant images of other countries and other cultures into our classrooms. Um, and this is, you know, these, these are, are ways that we can start to mend our divides. There are ways that we can build powerful and wonderful collaborations and coalitions um, across, the, across the globe. And how, how, how do you see this um, hybrid education? How, how do you take advantage of not being able to see each other and try to make those bonds in the distance. Yeah. And then the difference when the kids see each other again, like it's a, it's a different world now. Yeah, no, so, you know, I'm a big, I think it's really important, you know, I, I'm a big fan of people being in person. <laughs> so <laughs> I want us to move to um, school communities where people can be together in person. and. Um, where we rely less, certainly less than we have over the last year on distance learning. Um, but I will say a couple things. And by the way, and I think in a lot of communities right now, because of the loss of relationships over the last couple of years and anxieties that kids have developed about relationships over the last couple of years, that the high, a very high priority, maybe the, the highest priority has to be relationship building and community building. That's going to be hard to get deep into academic engagement if you don't do the strong work to build communities. So um, I, that's one thing that I would say. And, and Making Care in Common has tools. The, the organization that I run at the Harvard Ed School, Making Care in Common has a relationship mapping strategy and other strategies um, on our website that can help in building communities. So I wanted to mention that. Um, But I also think we should enter a time where we think creatively about hybrid learning. That, you know, it may be that we want the best history or math teacher in the world presenting certain portions of, of a class to our kids um, online. And then teachers can work with small groups of kids to really digest the material and interpret the material. That we do have opportunities now to think about hybrid learning in ways that can be very creative and powerful. And we should really pursue those ways. Um, 
And again, I don't think that the, the online learning, we don't want to substitute for in-person interaction, but it can supplement those in-person interactions in very powerful ways. And how, how could you develop a little bit more, please, about the Making Caring Common project? Because I think people would like to understand a little bit more what is it that you do and is, is there a way to do something like that here or, or is something that we are already doing? I don't know. So maybe people would like to hear more about yeah, Marcia, the project. Well, thank you, Marcia. I really, <laughs> I really appreciate the question. So, yes. you know, Making Caring Common is really does um, two main types of work. One type of work we do is we are trying to put caring for other, we, we believe in our country, in the United States, we have elevated personal success and individualism is the primary goal of child raising, happiness and achievement. And we have demoted or, or, or made secondary or marginalized caring for other people in the common good. So a lot of our work is about how do we put caring for other people front and center in child raising again? We think that's the most important thing we can do. And that the reason we are having so many problems in our societies is because we haven't put caring for other people and the common good front and center in child raising. So that's one thing Making Caring Common does. But we also work with schools and we provide them with resources and strategies for developing empathy, for developing gratitude, for developing caring for other people, for understanding justice, um, for, for pursuing justice, for creating close caring school communities for reducing bullying for reducing sexual harassment and you know we would love to work we, we would love to work with people in other countries um, they can have access to our resources and strategies or they can join our caring schools network where we would have an opportunity to work with you somewhat more intensively um, and that's a package that's a set of things that we ask schools to do that we think will help build these capacities and this is a, uh, do, you, do you see this as a long-term project with the schools or is one intervention and then, and then you guys? Uh... No, you know, it, it's, a, it's, not, um, it's a long-term project in the sense mm -hmm. that we hope the schools will stay with it over the long term. It's not a heavy burden project. And I say that because I know how busy people in schools are. So we try to develop strategies that are easy to implement and that are fun and that are engaging, that people want to do as opposed to another responsibility or another burden for teachers. We can't keep creating more responsibilities and burdens for teachers. So we try to create strategies that are fun and engaging for kids and for adults and for, and for teachers and that build these capacities like empathy and gratitude. So that's, that's how we think about the work. And we hope that teachers and educators will sustain the work over time, because if you don't sustain it over time, it's really hard to make a difference. Yeah. Exactly. So in order to really uh, have this going throughout the years and, and the kids could receive these messages and repeat these messages, it would be uh, easier for, for the whole community to act yeah. in that perspective and in that line. Yeah. And how, how do you envision this could be done in, 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 in another country? Like, have you done it? Yeah, no other, well, certainly other countries, many people in other countries use some of our specific resources. Mm -hmm. I think we could, we could develop a partnership with another country around working in their schools. Um, and I would love to do that, but we would have to be guided by people in that other country like, like you Around the, around the specific context we were working in and what kinds of strategies were more likely to be effective in the particular context in that country. And some of our strategies might have to be adapted to, to, be, to work in another country. So those are the kind of things we think about. Very important, as, as you say, they're not part of the curriculum. And, and I think the biggest message here is that it's something that now through this pandemic is very urgent. It's very, I think that's exactly right. It's always been urgent. And through most of, mm. um, uh, most of the history of the United States, we knew it was urgent. We stopped paying attention to it in a big way about 50 years ago. And that's a complex story. But I don't think there's anything more important than we can, that we can do than help kids care for other people. It's, it, it's absolutely at the foundation of our society and our communities. And um, so I think we have to put it front and center. And I think it's something, morality is very complicated and people disagree about how to teach morality. 
But caring for other people is something I think everybody can agree on. Like we really need to help kids do that and caring for people who are different from you. So it's something I think parents and schools can agree on as well. And how, how do you cope with the differences in, in, with the children? Give, give us an example of, of how you teach them or what is the message when you see someone that is very different from you? Like how, yeah, how to address it? You know, so, you know, one of our strategies is to get kids, for example, to write biographies of kids who have been invisible to them in the school building or to do collages or portraits of kids that they don't know in the school building who are different from them or to interview somebody in their neighborhood who has been different from them and to write about the interview or to do a circle of concern exercise where you ask who's in your circle of concern, who's not in my circle of concern. Is the school secretary or the bus driver, the custodian, are they in my circle of concern? Is a kid who's different from me in race or gender not in my circle of concern? And how do I expand my circle of concern? That's another exercise we do. We do another strategy called humans at my school, which builds, which builds empathy and helps people find similarities across differences. So we have a number of strategies like that. Um, we have strategies around gratitude, about kids expressing um, gratefulness for people who contribute to their lives, including people who are different from them, who have contributed to their life. So anyway, that, I hope that gives you a sense about the kind of strategies that we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. And is there a message that you would like to share here with, with our audience that is listening? Uh, Yeah, no, I, I appreciate I appreciate the, the question and I um and I appreciate the audience for being interested in this issue. I um I would say that there are two things that I think are most important. One is caring for people who are different from you, and we have to cultivate that capacity in, in our kids. Almost everybody cares for somebody, and, and almost everybody cares for somebody a lot, and it's usually their family and friends. We need to help kids care for people who are outside their family and friends, you know, who And that's how you build a fair and just world, when you can care about people who are different from you and take their perspectives and represent their interests. And the other message, I think, is that we need children who really understand what justice is and are able to pursue justice. Those are big, big uh, words. They're big, They're big yeah. ones. They're the, big. the big words. And, and could you explain us a little bit more um, The, the connection that you see uh, with language, for example, the language that you use, the, the language that kids are using in, this, in, in the digital world, uh, that they have these words that could be very difficult to, for other kids and, and how to address those uh, language difficulties. Do, do you mean things like digital bullying that are going on? Exactly. Going online, yes, online. Mm -hmm. With the language. This, this is not my area of, of expertise. Um, <laughs> like Sue, Sue Swearer, S-W-E-A-R, um, E-R, do, does work in this area. Emily Weinstein mm -hmm. and Kari James. There are people who do a lot of work in this area and know a lot about it. But... Um, And I think there are things you can do online to reduce bullying. But I also think that ultimately the answer to this problem is the way we raise our kids. <laughs> that if we, in our, in our homes and in our schools, if we really underscore that um, you can't degrade other people and that there are consequences for degrading other people. And we expect you to be a much better person than that. We're effective at conveying that message We're going to see less bullying and sexual harassment online. So I think we need, there are things technologically we can do to help with this and conversations with kids are important to have. But the fundamental work is still, in, is developing in kids a moral identity, of developing in kids deep concern for other people. That's really what our challenge is. And for parents. And for parents. This is, yes. What, what would be the, how do you see for the parents connection with the parents educated. now? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Parents and educators, definitely, yeah. Yes, because now in this world, uh, what we have seen is that parents had taken a different role to educating and trying to do what they were supposed to do in the school. Now parents are doing it at home too. Yeah. So you, you can imagine the difficulties for parents to try to support the kids in this emotional uh, challenge. 
So what would you say to parents? What, what would be your you know, message? You know, I think for, for parents, it's important. You know, one of the things that a lot of us tell our kids, I'm not sure if this is true, how, how much this is true in other countries, one of the things a lot of us tell our kids is the only the, the thing the only thing that's important to me is that you're happy. And what if instead we said the only thing that's important to me is that you're kind, that you're caring, that you care about justice. That's one concrete thing that we could really do with our kids. William James on his deathbed only said there are only three important things in life. The first is to be kind, the second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. And, and what if we, our actions really um, spoke, our actions really reflected those words so that we were paying as much attention to our kids being caring as we do to their achievements and to their happiness day to day. You know, we were expecting them to help around the house. We were expecting them to help out neighbors. We were doing service with them in our communities that we really made caring for others a priority in our day-to-day -day lives with our kids. Thank you so much. I think that is so valuable uh, to hear that it's basically trying to change a concept of promoting them the kindness and trying to show it uh, throughout the work. That's right. That we do uh, throughout our model, throughout our actions. What we, mo what we model, what we expect, are we modeling it? Are we expecting it? Do our kids respect and trust us? And do they want to be like us? Because if they don't respect and trust us, they're not going to learn from what we model. So we also have to make sure our, our kids respect and trust us. And if they don't, we have to figure out how to repair the relationship. So that's part of the work too. And that's part of the work that you do, like trying to build these relationships and, and help to yeah. overcome this. Yeah, you got to build healthy, close, loving relationships with your kids too, which most parents are doing, but... Yeah, I mean, I think uh, everyone who is dealing with the kids at home know that uh, the, the world changed in terms of how you relate to the kids, to your own kids at home. Yeah. And then the other thing is the reverse shock when they go back to school, right? Because That's right. That's right. Then we have to deal with how they feel, how the kids are feeling when they are going back to school and, and seeing that they grew and that they're different in, in ways of how people overcome the pandemic. Yeah, and yeah. the pandemic that's is different for every family, I guess. That's right. No, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's really been a pleasure to be here with you. No, thank you. And I hope this is the, the beginning of, of the talk that we're going to see in, in, the, in the followers uh, panelists and uh, seeing this point of view from you and your contribution to these difficulties is so, so important. So hopefully we will be in touch again. Great, to, I hope so too. To I, hope work. Chance, I hope we get a chance to work together. Take care. Yes. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye, be well.